Hi and welcome back. I've been away, but I'll be talking a little bit more about that in another film. So this film is an extract from a presentation I made recently with Dr. Eric Gordon for the Overcoming Long Covid and CFS Summit. It's happening next week from February the 7th, 2023 through to the 14th. It's completely free to attend and watch all of the presentations live. There is a link in the description if you'd like to know more. My presentation was in fact around the entire treatment landscape for long COVID at the moment, from what you can get from your pharmacy, uh, moving on to your GP, to perhaps your specialist, and then even further afield to various international specialists with very specific interest and skill sets who might be able to offer you certain treatments that you can't get closer to home. I also talked about how all of this fits in with what you might choose to do from a holistic standpoint. But one of the tangents that I and Dr. Eric Gordon went on was the thorny ongoing subject of viral persistence. And that is the extract I'm about to play now. This is, in a sense, the massive elephant in the room. Um, and we don't, at the moment, we have a huge amount of circumstantial evidence that is pointing towards viral persistence, but we don't yet have a smoking gun. And this is the perpetually frustrating thing about it. And this is the biggest answer that we need, or the question that we have and the answer that we need to be able to work out how we develop therapeutics. Now, we have evidence for, you know, all sorts of whether it's talking about a lot of the evidence, where I talk about circumstantial evidence, it's about finding bits of this viral debris many, many, many months after an initial infection. And this is either found in biopsies or in stool samples or in autopsies. A very scary study uh, or potentially scary study recently published in Nature literally this week um, did autopsies, I think, on 40 odd people and found high. And these were people who on the whole had died because of COVID. Um, so very severe acute infections, but there was widespread virus in the brain and in the nervous system. And this is the sort of thing that we sort of desperately hope doesn't happen with mild infections, but short of getting ethics to go and euthanize 20 long haulers and look in their brains, you know, we're never really going to find out. That's the problem is that it's a, we, the smoking gun is almost impossible to find unless we start chopping people open in an unethical way because anything that the body is shedding at the moment appears to be debris we don't yet have that nailed on indicator that says yes you know here we have virus in the appendix or the lung tissue or the gut or you know or even you know spinal fluids or wherever right it's and, and and but let's just, let's just take this sort of sort of thought experiment a bit further. Let's say that we do find that there is a degree of viral persistence, and let's say that it's in the appendix or something like that, or you know the eyeball or the testicle or somewhere that's difficult for you know things to the, get. The to immune system it. doesn't get as there as well. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, that's, that we um, call them immune protected areas, or yeah. Something. Um, so apparently immunologists actually are a bit touchy about this subject now uh, yeah. because the immune system gets everywhere, actually, if you look right. properly. But but still. <laughs> not, not, not as much of it. Yeah. Right. Not as much. Yeah. 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 Um, so but let's say that it is there. I guess there's a couple of questions that come out of that. The first of them is, does everybody who's had COVID still have this persistent virus in them? And is the only difference in the long haulers that we're the ones reacting to it because of our predisposition to whatever factors that means that our immune system is that little bit more trigger happy. Mm -hmm. And if our immune system is that little bit more trigger happy, then that might set off the cascade of symptoms and the vicious cycle that generates long COVID symptoms. Does that mean that to, in order to recover, we need to wipe out the virus? No, not necessarily. Not if people who have... Um, have the virus and don't have long COVID symptoms, still have the virus too. What we have to do is to calm the body down so that we cease responding to the virus, right? Because, there, you know, medical history is littered with, you know, I, I don't want to say dozens, hundreds or thousands, but so many viruses that can remain latent in our bodies, they don't necessarily all have to create symptoms. So the idea that there is persistent virus with long COVID isn't necessarily a disaster, even if we can't 
develop the therapeutics required to eliminate that virus or to find it or whatever. We just have to stop the body reacting to it. Because we, the the idea, just before I, I'll finish, yeah. the idea that only long haulers would have persistent virus and people who clear the virus don't, or people who don't, <laughs> sorry, people who don't develop long COVID symptoms after acute infection don't, I find that to be less likely than some proportion of everybody retains a bit of the virus hiding around somewhere and we're just the ones who react to it. I think that's more likely. Yeah, well, again, the persistence, it, it, because this is an RNA virus, I mean, there's been a few of them have been found to persist a little bit. So obviously they can do it. You know, that was the argument in the beginning is that no RNA viruses don't persist, but we keep finding that some of them do. So this very well could be. And I, I'm inclined to think that you're, I agree with your logic because we treat a lot of chronic Lyme disease and I, I can, I see that there are people who have good evidence of 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 Lyme, but their bodies, it's the reaction to the Lyme. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, it's, that's the issue. It's the fact that it, it's a little bit like the, the, the DNA viruses, the things we know that persist and stay in your body, the Epstein-Barr and the HH6 and the cytomegalovirus, and they're in everybody almost. And yet only some people have problems because it's their own immune system's failure to either keep the virus down or mitigate your over response because it can be either way. You can be still fighting the virus or you can just be making a lot of inflammatory noise because you think you see the virus. And, and this is where viral debris may be exactly the same as viral persistence in terms exactly. of actually creating the symptoms. What's the difference? The difference is it's not necessarily that the virus is in our bodies rampaging, destroying cells like it was in the acute infection. It's our body responding to a stimulus in a very troubling way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what comes up with the spike protein. Because remember, what kills people with COVID isn't that first week when the virus is replicating crazily. It's the, se it's the second, third week when your body is, is reacting crazily. Because <laughs> one of the things the virus does is that it doesn't let the initial immune response be as effective. And that throws, a, a, it just throws off the symphony of the, the, synchron the synchronicity of, the, of um, the immune responses. And so you wind up with inappropriate, what we call innate immune system happening later on when it should have quieted down by now. So if you'd like to attend the Overcoming Long Haul and CFS Summit starting on Tuesday, February the 7th, please do hit the link in the description. There's a very varied slate of presentations, and in fact, you may not be on board with all of the subjects covered, and that's fine, but there is some real gold in there. Some on the first few days, which I'm particularly looking forward to, include Dr. Jordan Vaughan on day one, Dr. Michael Peluso on day two, and Drs. Kent Holtorf and Kelly McCann on day three. However, there are fully seven days of presentations, and mine is on day five, which is Saturday the 11th. It's all free to watch live, however, if you'd like an all-access pass, which means you can watch any and all of the presentations anytime forever, as well as having access to all of the transcripts, then that is available for $97 or about £80. If you use the link in the description, then I get a small percentage, which of course is very gratefully received. You might have noticed that over time I've resisted just about any and all attempts to monetize this channel, and I wouldn't be promoting the conference unless it was also available for free. So that's about it for now. Look after yourselves. Until next time.